It's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, episode 48. We're going to be talking about more sweet things today. F- for that purpose, I brought my sweet thing. Oh, God. <laughs> Lauren is here. Hi. And she's here for a specific reason. So last week, we talked about uh, sugar, like what actually is, quote unquote, natural sugar, um, which is, a, a, as most things are, a surprisingly complex topic. Today, we're going to talk about like the the, the alternative sweeteners, uh, low calorie or no calorie sweeteners, things used instead of quote unquote natural sugar. And uh, Lauren has kind of a checkered history with such products. It's occurring to me that I think we've mentioned this now on like nearly every one of my appearances on this podcast. Well... It's one of the most important things about you. <laughs> that I can't handle alternative sweeteners. Yeah. It's, she's like a gremlin. You can't put her in the pool after midnight or bad things happen. It's sort of a similar thing. Don't give her sorbitol unless Ever. you want to see what, what happens. Well, so it's not that bad. <laughs> in, in, yes, in the most polite language possible, what do sugar alcohols specifically do to you? They make my digestion not good. Okay. Do they cause gas? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and l- various types of loose stools, right? <laughs> I cannot believe I agreed to do this. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> We're all grown ups here. Okay. Yes, they make everything feel yucky. <laughs> Got it. All right. Everything sort of empties out. Yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and start our our deep dive on alternative sweeteners by talking about the sugar alcohols, which are the ones that really give you trouble. Mm -hmm. You can divide, the whole world of kind of alternative sweeteners can be divided into two categories, like nutritive versus non-nutritive sweeteners, uh, i.e. does it have calories? Um, You could say natural versus artificial, but that's really, you know, it's highly debatable as to what actually is artificial versus natural and whether or not it actually even matters. Um, Alternative sweeteners, you could say, versus what's the opposite of an alternative? Mainstream sweeteners? Primary sweeteners? I don't know. (laughs) Sugar. Basic. You're basic. Basic ass mainstream sweeteners. Chuggy sweeteners. Is that what the kids say now? Well, I think we've already missed that. They already, they're done. Uh, You missed that, Grandpa Ragusea. That's what the kids said yesterday. (laughs) Got it. Okay. Um, But, you know, all of these would work if you said instead um, sugar alcohols versus high intensity sweeteners. So basically all of the alternative sweeteners that aren't uh, sugar alcohols or all the ones that I can think of, all the popular ones are also incredibly sweet, like vastly more sweet than the benchmark, which is sucrose table sugar, right? Um, you're talking about, you know, something like aspartame or or, or uh, sucralose, like you're talking about sweeteners that are 200, 300, 400, 500 times as sweet as sugar. And that might sound like a good thing, Um, But it's a bad thing in the sense that, like, if you want to put out a product that can be used as a substitute for sugar, weird things are going to happen if it's five, if (laughs) it's a packet of like sweet and low that is 500% sweeter Mm -hmm. than table sugar, right? Sure. So they have to like cut it with all kinds of things for for a number of reasons. Artificial sweeteners are often much more sweet than sugar. They also often have like weird tastes or weird after like how would you describe some of the the weird tastes of artificial sweeteners um they yeah they definitely have like a weird like almost like some of them this is gonna sound really weird it's one of those things it's, where things taste like they smell go ahead go ahead like a like lemon pledge aftertaste like yeah. a chemically aftertaste you're not making that up okay okay good um see i grew up my my stepdad growing up was diabetic so i ate lots of sugar-free stuff growing up oh they and had I like sugar-free candy in the sugar, house and everything sugar-free kool-aid sugar-free popsicles like right. sugar-free jello and i was fine and then and i stopped eating those things on a regular basis mm-hmm. and then okay and then you came back to it and yeah yeah you can never go home again can you, you? know it's because i was in college and i decided i wanted to take flintstone vitamins 
It's like, I'm a grown lady. I can take whatever vitamins I want. And I bought Flintstone di- vitamins, and they made me feel so bad. And I couldn't figure it out. And then I was, they have sorbitol and mannitol in them. I'm a grown woman, <laughs> I can so I'm going to use a children's product. <laughs> I, my mom wouldn't let me have them. And so uh-huh. I was like, I can go buy my own Flintstone vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> So anyways, yes, yeah, so there's there's all kinds, you know, the, the the molecules that are used as sweeteners in lieu of quote unquote natural sugars often bond with taste bud receptors other than the sweetness one. So for example, saccharin, which is one of the oldest artificial sweeteners, which we'll get back to, saccharin has this infamous bitter aftertaste. Because what it does is it also bonds to the bitterness receptors in your taste buds. Mm. Furthermore, a lot of these molecules are also aromatic. And I'm not using pedants. I'm not using aromatic there in the chemical, the chemistry class definition of aromatic. I just mean the colloquial version, which means it's, it's our, 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 our olfactory system can perceive them, right? Right. Um, and of course, as, as, as you know, um, our, our noses are much more complex instruments than our taste buds, right? Mm-hmm. They can they can millions upon millions and trillions, in fact, of distinct smells are appreciable by your nose, whereas there's only five widely accepted basic tastes perceived by your your taste buds. So some of these sweetening molecules are also incidentally um, smellable. And so you will perceive them as having a flavor. Remember, a flavor is a combination of taste and smell. So for example, monk fruit extract, which is another one maybe we'll get back to if we have time, that's very popular and has a lot of sort of advantages for it, has a fruity smell, mm. right? Um, another one is uh, some of the, you know, there's a couple of chemicals found in um, licorice, Mm-hmm. That are extremely sweet, and in fact, do you remember, do you remember the licorice like the the licorice video that I made? It was the one I had to buy. Um, I had to buy absinthe for. I remember you buying absinthe, but and you uh, were like, "Don't drink that." Yes, yeah. yes, but I'll be quite honest with you. Did not watch the video. That's okay. I don't 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 stress about it. I wouldn't watch it if I were you. <laughs> But anyway, I mentioned that w- one one of the big flavor molecules in uh, in licorice and and adjacent plants like uh, uh, oh, what's the little seed that's in lots anise. of Italian food? Oh, it's anise seed, or in Italian food, it's the mm, it's bigger fennel. Oh, yes. fennel seed. All right. Fennel. So it's there's there's this stuff called anethol which is one of the defining sort of flavor molecules there. And I mentioned in the video that it's like 600 times sweeter than sugar or something like that. And someone in the comments said, okay, well then why don't they just use that as an artificial sweetener? And I said, because it, it, it tastes like licorice. And he was like, well, why can't you like filter out the licorice? And it's like, no, it's like, you can't filter the molecule out of the molecule. Like it's, (laughs) it's the molecule Mm -hmm. that tastes sweet is the same molecule that gets up into your schnoz and you perceive it as licorice flavor. But I like that creativity of thinking. (laughs) Well, the dude is not wrong because that's a thing that people do. Um, There's, there's anethol and then there's another, there's an acid that's in licorice that is Mm -hmm. also used as a sweetener. And I often find it in my freaking protein powders the ones that i buy when they're out of the one that i normally get because you make me go and patronize a local business instead of just buying things on the internet like a civilized person eddie's health shop go eddie's health shop (laughs) love you eddie's glad to do it she Thank thank her for my <laughs> business, okay? So yeah, I've gotten like several kind of, you know, different branded protein powders that clearly taste of licorice, even nice. though they're not advertised as being like licorice flavored, um, including the chocolate one that I'm using right now, which it's is- It's chocolate licorice? It's chocolate licorice, That's yeah. It's disgusting. It is. I can't believe you drink this. But things. if you've ever had like un, like legit unflavored whey protein powder- it is so gross. Like, I can't even, you want to cover that up with anything you got. I mean, this is a whole nother conversation, but like, do you really need those things at all? Do I really need those things at all? Probably not. <laughs> I don't know. Do you really need all of this in your life? <gasps> oh, uh, it has been gestures the- <laughs> at the musculature of his upper body, not the middle body. Don't look at that. You I clearly don't. 
I just want to say that it's daylight savings time and it's cold and gray and we have had like the laziest day and I have also been writing all day long uh-huh. and I feel a little slap happy and now you're asking me. I ask you all the time if I can slap you in Go the ahead, face. Go ahead, you can slap me. So I say no. You can slap me in the face. Go ahead. No, I'm not going to do Not on camera. <laughs> Well, we'll give you time to think about it. It's a standing invite for the duration of this episode to keep you and the audience interested. It's an ongoing joke in our relationship that yes. whenever you say you're tired, I say, do you want me to slap you in the face? Yes. And you always say, no. <laughs> I'm waiting for the day you say yes. So anyway, I presume that I have anathol or something like that in this protein powder okay. that they're using as an artificial sweetener. I can't tell by looking at the label... Um, it lists sucralose, which is an incredibly popular artificial sweetener, um, but it doesn't list anything else. It does, however, list natural and artificial flavors, uh, right? Which is like a heading that at least under U.S. labeling laws, you can you can sneak all kinds of things under that. Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing it's there, but they can't use too much of it, A, because it tastes like licorice and nobody... Does anyone who's not a grandpa like licorice? Or, or Scandinavian. The Scandinavians love their licorice. But the Scandinavian licorice is a different beast. Is it? Like when I think of licorice flavor, I think of the black jelly beans yeah. at Easter, which I kind of like um, in small doses. Yeah. But like Scandinavian licorice is like punishment. <laughs> like, that's how you know who the real beasts are. Yeah. Them Vikings. Well, you know that like those, those like happiness studies where they find that like the Finns are the, are the happiest people in the world Mm -hmm. and what, what they, you know, one potential explanation that is borne out by the research is that they're happy because they live in such a dark, gloomy, horrible place. And as the result, their expectations for life are like really reasonable. God. Well, there you go. <laughs> like, they don't they just don't expect a lot out of life and so when they get something good, it's kind of a it's kind of a surprise. I have one Finnish friend who I played derby with and she was an absolute ball of light. Oh yeah. A total delight. Yeah. yeah. She's like the Miss Universe who goes Finland. <laughs> yeah. Do we have to do France now? France. France! <laughs> I'm sorry to everyone who had their headphones in just then. I how has that woman not been found yet? Like since she went viral? Because that was, she did that. How do you in, know she hasn't? Because I went looking because I want to uh, know like, who she is and what does she actually talk like? She's probably embarrassed. She's, I know. She's she probably. Disappeared. I, I'm sure she's a lovely person. And The French are not known for it. So she does not want to be known for the scream. Yeah, I guess so. They've got those right to be forgotten laws in the EU where oh. she could potentially ask the internet to purge itself of there you go. every instance of. Ah! Yeah. Which doesn't seem like a realistic no, thing, but it's already been parodied too many times. Yeah, I know. Anyway, anyways, people don't like when I'm on the podcast because I get you too far off the. Uh... People love it when I go off track. That's like the selling point of the whole program. <laughs> okay, all right, back to the sugar alcohols. <laughs> oh, sugar alcohols. Okay, what in the heck are sugar alcohols? Sugar alcohols um, are not booze. They won't go to your head, unfortunately. They are, totally unsurprisingly, molecules that kind of resemble sugars, but also kind of resemble alcohols. Um, it, you know, just to sum it up really quickly from last week, because I know you didn't listen, honey, I wouldn't blame you. Um, a, a sugar in the natural world is generally a ring of carbon, usually between five and seven carbon atoms, each uh, stuck to a water, an H2O. That's why it's called a carbohydrate. Um, and they're usually arranged in like a six-sided ring. Uh, but sometimes they're in lines and anywho. Um, so a sugar alcohol is like that, except it has a hydroxyl group attached to, I think, usually each of the carbon atoms. And a hydroxyl group is one negatively charged oxygen stuck to a hydrogen. Um, and hydroxyl glu- groups are stuck to the carbons is one of the defining features of alcohols as a class of chemicals. So that's what sugar alcohols are. In practice, um, they, they're they usually like 70, 80% as sweet as table sugar, sucrose, um, and they can have calories. They are digestible to an extent, but you're talking about like between one and two calories per gram as opposed to like four calories per gram, which is what you normally get with real carbohydrates. Um, the reason why they've been such a delight in your life, honey, um, is that... 
uh, some of them, like say, for example, sor- sorbitol will th- like the reason they don't have many calories is that they are not digestible in the upper intestine, the small intestine. They then head down to the lower intestine where one of two things happens. Um, one, they get fermented, right? They just mm-hmm. get eaten by, by bacteria in your microbiome, just in the same way that like fiber from beans gets eaten and then the musical fruit plays its performance. Um, <laughs> um, so there's that. And then there's another possibility, which allows us to, <laughs> this is the, the, the best t- piece of terminology I've come across in a long time. And we're going to have to get some t-shirts made with it. Um, so we, when you asked me to do this yesterday, I must not have been listening. I know exactly. Closely. That's all right. But you're here now and it's all going great. <laughs> so there's this stuff called osmotic diarrhea, oh, God. which by the way, kids, if you need a band name, Osmotic diarrhea. (laughs) So basically, without getting into an explanation of osmosis, which is a phenomenon I only barely understand, (laughs) like 80% understand, okay? Um, Basically... The what's in the sugar, the sugar alcohols themselves or ions that become disassociated from the sugar alcohols when they dissolve in your digestive system and all of that, um, they are osmotically active, meaning that in effect, they sort of stick to water or are there, and it's going to impede the transmission of the transition of water from your fecal mass <laughs> into the lining of your intestine where it can be reabsorbed and used by your body again, right? Like one of the main functions of the large intestine, the lower intestine is to simply absorb out all of the water that is in your digested food. Um, you want lots of water in your digested food for the initial stages of digestion because you want to keep all of that stuff fluid as it were so that like they can all get smushed around and <laughs> Oh, you're loving this. Um, but when it's time for it to leave your body, you want to get the water out so that you have a a, a stool that is easier to deal with. Um, and also just because like your body would like to use that water for other things. Like what, like what actually kills people when people get dangerous diarrhea from various kinds of infections. Dehydration. It's dehydration is what actually kills them most of the times, you know? So anyways, um, Sugar alcohols can result in osmotic diarrhea. (laughs) That is to say, poop that has a whole lot of osmotically active solutes in it. Um, I just would like the floor to open up (laughs) and swallow me whole. They prevent the water from (laughs) passing across the semipermeable membrane of the inside of your intestine and going where it belongs, right? It stays within the fecal matter. And that's why you have a poop that's an emergency. Um, (sighs) <laughs> Sorry. I know. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. <laughs> Doing okay? Okay. So the thing is is that not all sugar alcohols are equal in these properties. And so you have to choose if if you're someone who is you find that you are predisposed to negative effects from consuming sugar alcohols, you want to choose your sugar alcohols safely and carefully. Just as, you know, if you're a small investor like us, you want to choose your investment opportunities wisely, uh, which is uh, why I'm delighted right now to talk about the sponsor of this episode, Masterworks. Masterworks is a, is a company that allows small investors like me and Lauren to uh, invest in fine art, um, which is something that like pretty much all the rich dudes do. And and now it's available to us slightly not as rich dudes as well. Masterworks paid out over $25.8 million last year because they let you invest in multi-million dollar works of art, real things from Picasso and Banksy. We're not talking about like made up NFTs that have no value in anyone's mind. You know, we're talking about things that have actual aesthetic and historical value. Then Masterworks team of analysts use data from millions of auction records to source and buy art, which they think has the greatest potential for appreciation. Then they divide those paintings up into shares so that you can invest without needing millions of dollars. And when it comes to selling the paintings and getting you a profit, Masterworks just wrapped one heck of a year. Nine exits with four of those occurring just since I partnered with them. So that's handing back 21, 10, 13, and 35% net on those exits. 
The contemporary art market is remarkably stable and independent of stocks and bonds. That's why even as stocks had their worst year since the 08 crisis, art prices rose on average 29%, according to Barron's, handily outpacing stocks. Consider, with that 35% net return from Masterworks, if you would put in 15 k for example, you'd walk away with over $20,000. Obviously, nothing is guaranteed, especially not in investing, but check out Masterworks and see if they can help you to diversify your portfolio. Their offerings tend to sell out within hours, not days, but my link will get you special access to skip their waitlist. Masterworks.art slash Ragusia. Go to masterworks.art slash Ragusia to find out if Masterworks is the right diversification option for your portfolio. Thank you, Masterworks. Anywho. Are we back to this? <laughs> Still this? Still this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there's one sugar alcohol which has been in the news lately, and that is erythritol. Have you heard about this, honey? What is that? Um, it is I, – I only just now found this out that it is known under a trade – well, there is a trade name for it. I don't know if anyone actually uses it, but it's Zeros. Okay. Which is What's exactly it what in? it sounds like, like zero and S. Uh, zeros. It is frequently used in combination with stevia. Mm -hmm. um, so it, you will see it. Um, there's a there's a there's like a you know a, a tabletop sugar replacement product called Truvia, which mm -hmm. has um, erythritol in it or zeros. Mm -hmm. It's also known as. It's in a um, lot of like um, natural sodas. Yes. Um, some Splenda formulations have this in it, and it's really it has become extremely popular in recent years in quote unquote keto f foods. Ah. Because what distinguishes erythritol from the others is that it is almost entirely absorbed into your bloodstream in your small intestine, which is why it tends to not cause bad gastrointestinal effects in people, right? Mm -hmm. Because the reason the sorbitol is completely wrecking your day is that you aren't <laughs> absorbing it. Mm -hmm. It's passing to your large intestine where bad things happen. Okay. Okay. So the thing about erythritol is that it's like 90% absorbed in the small intestine into your bloodstream, just the way that sugar normally is. Mm -hmm. The difference, of course, being that your body is not able to use it as energy, okay. right? So you end up eliminating, you end up peeing it out basically mm -hmm. without it having really done much to you. And that's why it has value. It can be used in higher quantity than other sugar alcohols because it's not going to reach your, your large intestine, um, which is awesome. But this giant study came out a couple of weeks ago um, tying erythritol to cardiovascular bad outcomes. Um, oh, I saw that. Yeah. And it wasn't – like a lot of these studies will come out you know, indicating that like some common thing that we eat – yeah, it has like a minor effect on cardiovascular outcomes and we freak out about it. This was not minor. Like mm -hmm. at least it wasn't minor for the people who eat a lot of erythritol. So when they, when they were looking at people who were in the top 25th percentile of, of erythritol eaters, I mm -hmm. guess is what you call that. Consumers. Consumer. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. So like the people who eat the, you know, the top, the 20, 25% of humanity that eats the most erythritol, their odds of certain bad, like, like a heart attack or stroke, it, it was like, it was like twice as high as, as comparable people. Next. It was, it, it was amongst those heavy users, erythritol was as big of a risk factor in heart attack and stroke as having diabetes is. Right, wow! Like it's it was not a small thing, which is why it 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 it, it was it legitimately got a lot of press. Yeah. Um, is there a, a a but coming? Like this isn't as bad as it seems. Um, or maybe if you control for X, it's really not. Okay, so. well, I could say but in the sense that um, one study is usually not enough to freak out about anything, right? Okay. Um, unless there's like an acute result where, like, you know, yes, we we gave this to one person and like she just melted into the floor in a puddle <laughs> and we had to scoop her up and throw her out. I think I saw the headline for this and I got freaked out because you drink diet soda. Yeah. And then I read it and I was like, oh no, he just drinks the chemical diet soda. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Not the natural diet <laughs> soda. I don't know if anyone sells erythritol as being natural, although it does occur naturally. It does. Well, yeah. they probably do sell it as being natural because it does but it's occur not naturally in like, in like very small quantities. It's in like not in your stuff. favorite beverage no, of no, choice, it's not. which is diet 
Pepsi. Good old aspartame is what we consume here in this family. Uh, excuse me. We do not. Okay. Just you. Sorry. Anyway. I can't believe I let you bring that nonsense into my house. Erythritol, <laughs> this sugar alcohol. So the we you know, one study is not enough to freak out about you know usually we just know from experience that usually we need to see several studies like this come out before it really starts to be a solid finding um but the the like the the other thing is that it's like some of these studies that correlate bad cardiovascular outcomes with a food they don't really have any kind of mechanism in mind like they don't know why it would cause that with this they kind of do um so erythritol has been shown in like test tube experiments to increase the activity of platelets so it results it it can create these little nuclei for blood clots um oh. And uh, you know, blood clot glo- goes floats into your brain, and that's that's a stroke, right? Yeah, I'm gonna leave this embarrassed and with anxiety. <laughs> I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> this is the worst. Sorry. <laughs> so, luckily, I don't I don't consume alternative sweeteners. So. Again, just one study. <laughs> just one study. We're all gonna die. <laughs> um. And you, like those, you know, like the sodas or whatever that use erythritol, mm-hmm. I think they usually use a very small quantity of it. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I would be a little bit worried if I was eating a ton of like keto snacks that have, mm-hmm. that are mostly erythritol. Because there are like, like the, the researchers who worked on this paper mentioned that like when they were picking up sample products, they found like keto candies and shit that were like the number one ingredient was erythritol by weight. <laughs> Well, because a candy is mostly yeah, sugar, you I know, that, and yeah, that's yeah, just yeah, the way it's going to be, you know? Yeah, true. true. Um, so, yeah, I, I've, until further, you know, information comes down the science pipe, I, <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I would maybe steer clear of those. But in general, you know, sugar alcohols are, seem to be pretty much fine as long as you aren't someone who is particularly reactive to them. And I, I found several papers indicating that like just differences in people's microbiome were predictive of whether or not they were bothered by sorbitol or something like that. Like you just have a different colony of bacteria in your gut and hmm. maybe, maybe you have some, like a lot of some bacteria that is particularly able to metabolize the sorbitol and, and you know, who knows? Um, But another, you know, kind of thing with all our alternative sweeteners is the possibility that they might interfere with your gut microbiome in certain ways. Um, There are three, saccharin, sucralose, and stevia have all, as far as I can tell, been proven to affect microbiome in like rodent studies. Um, And a lot like, you know, really, really just changing the number of bacteria of different kinds that are in your gut. And that's something that people are studying and as well, they should, that's something to be a little bit freaked out about. I, you know, don't, don't feel good about that with my diet soda intake, but as bad as all of this may seem, uh, n- none of it, pa- it all pales in comparison to the original, uh, alternative sweetener, ah, yes. which is the, the oldest one documented by history, as far as I can tell, which is called sugar of lead, also known as lead acetate, which okay. is exactly what you would think it is. Okay. <laughs> You so, know, but we really should be eating how our ancestors yeah, ate exactly. because That's they right. were so much healthier before all this processed food. I know. <laughs> the Romans, such healthy people. So the Romans did a thing where they would, they'd make wine and then they would boil the like residual grape must down in a, in a, one of the lead, you know, the lead pots that they used and the result would be like there's like an acid in the grape must would react with the lead resulting in this little salt called um called lead lead to acetate and it tastes somewhat sweet not super sweet but it tastes somewhat sweet and it was this source of sweetness that they could get in the absence of honey or other sweeteners mm-hmm. that they had in their world um as you know um lead consumption and lead poisoning and the cognitive de- permanent cognitive declines caused mm. by exposure to lead, especially in childhood, um, has been mentioned as one of the factors causing the decline of Rome. <laughs> um, <laughs> they but, were here for a good time, not a long no, time. <laughs> and yet their decline took 400 years. Mm. They, had, they had time for both. Um, lead, I mean, lead does taste sweet. 
Like that's a thing. Oh, that's why kids eat the paint chips. Exactly. That's why kids eat the paint chips. Yeah. Yep. So there you go. So it couldn't, it can get worse is all I'm saying. At least you're not having sugar of lead. At least. At least. The first. I'm just having sugar. Good just, for you. Just sugar. Straight, natural. From the jars by the spoonful. <laughs> we buy jars of sugar? We keep our, well, I guess it's in a Rubbermaid. It's in a Rubbermaid. No. Well, not a Rubbermaid, but. A, a plastic um, maid? It's an OXO pop top thing. Hashtag not an ad. Not an ad. The earliest modern alternative sweetener is saccharin, which was invented by a guy at Johns Hopkins University here in the U.S. in the late 19th century. He was playing with various petroleum byproducts, um, which it shouldn't be super surprising because like lots of petroleum products, you know, from, I mean, just from being at the gas station, you know, can smell sweet. Um, Sorry, daylight savings time. You're, you're all right. You're doing just fine. <laughs> Most people yawn when they listen to me talk. You're just, you're giving voice to their experience is what you're doing. They I'm, feel I'm, seen now. I'm the audience surrogate in this exactly. experience. That's They're, they were point. also deeply embarrassed by the first segment. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, petroleum, the you know, various kind of petroleum molecules mm. can sort of smell or taste mm. sweet. And so it's not surprising that they found one that was safe enough to eat that is sweet. And before anyone like gets really freaked out, like, oh, you're eating petroleum. Well, it's like, well, what, you know, what is petroleum? Petroleum is biological material. It's, mm. it's dead animals and plants that has just been sort of breaking down underneath the, the ground for a long time. Um, what what the difference between a hydrocarbon and a carbohydrate is that hydrocarbons don't have oxygen, whereas carbohydrates do. But otherwise, you're talking about the same kind of kind of stuff. Anyways, so uh, this guy who was you know researching petroleum byproducts f- discovered saccharin in the U.S. in the early 19th century, or as the Brits would say, saccharine, which <laughs> I only know because I've listened to Def Leppard and. I have to get on my Def Leppard voice now, so it's hold on. It's uh, do I need to? It's, yeah, it's yeah. no, no. It's not going to be loud. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the secret. Mutt Lang's like secret to massive backup vo- vocal sounds from the '80s was that you sing quietly with a lot of air in your tone, and then you layer it 35 times, and it sounds like an entire football stadium of dudes. Mm-hmm. So how so, does that work in concert? Uh, you, the, the, a guy on the side of the stage hits a sample oh, oh. <laughs> pad. No, actually, I think, to, as far as I, I mean, Def Leppard denies using backing tracks, and they've got three guys in that band who can sing. <laughs> and if you have three guys doing that together, it's going to sound pretty big, especially right. with a bunch of reverb on it. So anyway, such as when they sing, you got the peaches, I got the cream, sweet to taste, saccharine. Are you going to get demonetized for that? <laughs> if there's any justice in this world. Hopefully it was so bad that the the copyright bots don't even they're like what was, what was that? <laughs> so anyway, the problem with saccharine is that it's like super bitter in addition to being sweet mm-hmm. and so it wasn't popular for anything until the the wars of the 20th century when sugar got in short supply and people started playing with it and pairing it with stuff and this is so like the reason that when you buy like a sugar free product and it's got three different sweeteners listed on it is mm-hmm. that it's like all of the artificial or, or alternative sweeteners have problems so they kind of like they, they you know they mix them in like what do you call it? Cocktails, right? Yeah. To sort of get different, you know, combined composite properties out of them. And so this is an example where if you combine saccharin with something like um, cyclamate uh, in a 10 to 1 ratio, what you get is sweet and low or specifically like non-US sweet and low now because cyclamate, which is another one of these, um, was banned in the US by the FDA in the seventies, I think. So there was a thing that you've probably heard of where um, they did a bunch, there was a bunch of research in the sixties and seventies about artificial sweeteners. Um, Aspartame they had looked at and cyclamate and some others. Is this like back when tab was? Yeah, yeah, it hmm. became controversial. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, because what they found was that they uh, it caused cancer, specifically bl- bladder cancer in rodent studies. Mm. Um, but the, those studies have come to be regarded as like 
classic example of bad, not bad science, but bad interpretation of science. Because the thing about those studies was that, A, they were giving the rats ridiculous dosages of this stuff. They were giving them like an amount that was equivalent literally to like 500 cans of Diet Coke or or Tab as the case may yeah. be, right? That'd make you feel um, pretty bad. Yeah, that's gonna, you know, too much of anything is not good yeah. for you, baby. Yeah, so there's that. Um, and then there was also the fact that like they later discovered that the mechanism that that were like aspartame or whatever will cause bladder cancer in rats, that, that mechanism just simply does not exist in humans. Like the thing that makes it crystallize. Really? Yeah, the thing that makes- um, I missed the debunking of that. <laughs> crystallize in the bladders of rats, like just does not happen in us. It's kind of that simple. Wow. Yeah. I totally missed that debunking. Right, yeah. I still believe that like aspartame and all of that will kill you. Absolutely. N- I mean, it may, but there's Just no- Just not that way. Yeah, not that way. <laughs> like that has been huh. like fully debunked. Interesting. And as a result, like there's no, you know, we still use aspartame in the States today, but for reasons that I have not been able to figure out from a historical perspective- um, cyclamate, which is often paired with saccharin to make sweet and low in countries not the United States, um, cyclamate got banned on the basis of those studies in the hmm. U.S. and it just never got unbanned. It, it seems to just be like an orphan, an orphan product where it could just there's no you know there's no deep pocketed interest that's super interested in selling hmm. it. So just no one go, does do, no one goes through all of the work of going to the FDA and saying hey you should change this stupid regulation. Interesting. Because nobody wants it. So, yeah. Well, fine. Fine, yeah. And then you get your aspartame, which is, that's like a NutraSweet and Equal and stuff. But again- This is like a parade of the 80s. It is. It, like Equal and Sweet and Low and NutraSweet. Yeah, this feels like the 80s. This was our childhood. Well, it's funny because from a historical perspective, I think that where like you and I probably first encountered- any of most of these sweeteners was in, in the little gum. Pa- oh, I was going to say in the little packets that would be on your restaurant table, and There's your mom those. would put them in her sweet tea. There's those if you lived Buddy. in a part of the country where people debased themselves with sweet tea, um, which I guess I live in that part now. But yeah, I, I was raised better. Okay, shut up. Um, yeah, gum. Gum. Yeah. So the reason that they first and gum is started- now all sorbitol. What's that? A lot of gum is now all sorbitol, yes. so I can't do it. Yes. Sugar alcohols work particularly well in gum for reasons. Um, the reason that they started putting it in gum, it has nothing to do with like, it wasn't like kids getting fat. <laughs> it was, what was it? Why would you want to sw- Why would you want to swap out real sugar for artificial for sugar teeth? for your teeth? Yes, because a- four out of five dentists agree. <laughs> yeah, there was like a dental panic about gum in the United States in the mid twentieth century. I think it. I suspect it probably had to do with like kids transitioning off of chewing tobacco because like chewing tobacco had been very popular yeah. and like baseball made it super popular and then baseball was just like oh we're giving children cancer so let's let's. You know, Let's give them gum, gum that looks like chewing tobacco. Exactly. That's right. And <laughs> has sugar in it. And the problem with like real sugar is that it's fermentable. And so there's oral bacteria that eat the sugar that sticks to your teeth. And they produce acid in response as a result. And the acid wears away at your teeth. So they started putting non-nutritive sweeteners into gum to protect kids' teeth. Mm. And sugar alcohols are good for that because- they they're they're you know they're all, they're about the same sweetness as table sugar, which means you can use the same like bulk of them. And think about all the jobs that sugar does in food other than make it sweet, right? I don't know. Oh, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, well, like, I'm, okay. Like, what is fudge? Fudge is sugar and butter. Oh, I in see. In a what certain you mean. crystalline I kind of configuration, right? I didn't know what you were asking me. <laughs> right, right. So, like, so, like, imagine fudge without sugar. Yeah. It would just be butter, right? And mm. it, it's, it's not just that it wouldn't be sweet. It also wouldn't have the same like textural I mean, and structural to, characteristics. To be fair, it would be butter and cocoa powder. And cocoa powder. Well, yes, assuming it's chocolate fudge. Okay, okay, okay. They make vanilla fudge, don't they? So then butter and vanilla. Okay. Hmm. Owned. I'm so owned. <laughs> so owned. <sighs> so... So anyway, like that's the thing. Like sugar, sugar does a lot of jobs in food for texture and structure and bulking and like moisture retention and all kinds of stuff. So it's not just a matter of adding sweetness. And so 
it's advantageous to put sugar alcohols into gums because, well, they're super shelf stable and like they, they bulk the same way. They retain moisture the same way, which is really important for gum. You know, it's, it's, they're, they're good, but now that means that you basically can't ever have gum. Which is fine because I feel like gum has really fallen off. Yeah. Whatever happened in to gum? Popularity. I loved gum. We watched the How It's Made episode about gum with the kids last night. Oh, it was really delightful. And it just made, made me realize they've never had gum. Yeah. There wasn't even that much gum in their hall. I mean, some every Halloween hall Has will like have one or two pieces a few things of that like no one's going to want, you know. Double bubble. Yeah, but there, I don't think there was any double bubble in there at all. That's crazy. Yeah, gum has gone by the wayside. Even if you, like, if you go to the store, there's minty gum persists, I think, huh. but. Wither gum. Is it because people used it as like a a chewing tobacco replacement, but then once both of those habits were kicked, gum had no purpose? I don't know. I mean, I think parents stopped giving it to their kids. Huh. It is ter- I, like I'm the thought of my children with gum and where gum would wind up in my house. <laughs> Good point. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see, where can I pick that up? Uh, we were talking about dental health and blah, 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 and sugar alcohols. Oh, okay. So like, yeah. So the the super sweet ones to make like a, to make something like a Splenda, which, which you can theoretically bake with because it's more heat stable than the others. Most of these that we've been talking about are not heat stable at all. They will just break down when you try to bake with them. Splenda is like a mix of sucralose and some bulking agents that to make it something that you can swap cup for cup with table sugar because sucralose is like 500 times more sweet than sugar, than sucrose so you can't just have like a cup full of sucralose so what they do is they bulk it out with dextrose and maltodextrin and that incidentally is where most of the calories in Splenda come from like because it has like some calories um, it's not from the the sweetener itself it's from the bulk the bulking agents got it um, you know and because they can't just like put like you know, sawdust or something in there. Like, Oh, but they tried. <laughs> oh, but they tried. Because <laughs> they need something that's going to be like crystalline and that will melt in water and all, all of those things. And dextrose and maltodextrin will Food we'll, science we'll do those. is so interesting. I'm glad you think so. There's this podcast you should listen to. <laughs> I s- <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> To be fair, I meant like going into a lab and playing with the stuff. Oh, okay. Like, like a chemistry Not listening set. to some dude who's not even trained in this shit talk about it. Yeah. I know. All right. Who wants to listen to that? Gotcha. <laughs> I love you. I love you. <laughs> okay. Uh, real quick, we should talk about some of the noobs because there's like new, like natural alternative sweeteners on the market. Um, the big, uh, a big one being monk fruit extract. Um, if I... Can you picture a monk fruit in your mind? Also known as a Buddha fruit. Does it look like a cantaloupe kind of? With no, a, oh. it looks like a plum on the outside. Oh. And on the inside, it, I, it looks like nothing I've ever seen before. But mm-hmm. anyways, so it's this like fruit from Southeast Asia that is has this like sweet, sweet juice, like many fruits. Most of the sweetness in it is just from fructose, like most fruits, but something like one to 2% of the weight of this fruit, which is a lot of it, um, proportionally speaking, is this kind of antioxidant called a m- 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 magrocide. M- m- magrocide? Magrocide. I, That's how I'd pronounce that. Yeah. Um, which is like, I, I mean, I looked at, you know, looking at the a structural diagram of it, it's like a really complex, big thing that seems to be made out of a bunch of sugars. You see lots of little six-sided rings mm-hmm. as part of its structure. I don't know what its deal is, but it tastes extremely sweet um, and is almost entirely indigestible and doesn't seem to kind of cause any of the problems that we've talked about thus far. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of a new arrival in the marketplace uh, I think the FDA only approved it in the U.S. like 10, 15 years ago, something like that. I'm sure they'll find problems with it, but for the, for the time being, we're in the honeymoon period with monk so fruit extract. So everybody just everybody, shove yeah, it in your face. Exactly. Um, then there's <laughs> allulose, which I have said before is my favorite because it's the one that does, to me, taste the most like sugar. It is found naturally in a few fruits like figs. Um, and dates and stuff like that. Um, the weird thing about allulose is that it also, re- well, like many of these, actually, it results in a slight cooling sensation. Um, 
So we have like temperature sensing, you know, chemesthetic stuff on our tongue, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why that's how chilies make us feel heat, right? Like some guy on the internet. I thought you meant chilies, the restaurant there no, for no, a no, second. No. no, there's no chilies in a chilies. What are you talking about? Chilies brings the heat. <laughs> I, somehow I doubt it. I feel God in this chilies tonight. Uh, um, <laughs> one dude on the internet one time was like, criticizing me for not considering the the heat of chili peppers as being a basic taste and saying that it was like a western scientific bias on my part hmm. and i was just like dude i'm you know i'm i'm sure i do that that's the kind of thing i do all the time but not in this case because what we know <laughs> is that the reason but this that, time i'm yes, right <laughs> the reason that that kind of spiciness the heat of a chili the reason that we don't consider that a taste is that we know what it acts upon and it's not your taste buds it acts upon this totally different receptor that is in your tongue and in your mucous membranes and stuff and it's like there to help you uh, sense temperature, like burn, like actually oh. being burned. So um, likewise, we have like sensors that help us perceive coolness, which are on our tongue and allulose and a lot of these other sweeteners uh, bonds at least a little bit with that sensor. And so you get a cooling response, which is why allulose, um, one of the places it's most used is in like frozen desserts, low ah, calorie frozen smart. desserts. I know. It's like these people are like, they, they, they go to school and they learn something. <laughs> they don't, no, I don't know. <laughs> um, other interesting property of allulose is that it is it somewhat inhibits the action of enzymes that break down starches for our digestion. So as a result, it can basically increase the proportion of starch in your diet that is resistant and therefore functions as fiber in your diet rather than sugar. Um, which is neat if you're trying to like lower calories. It's not neat if you're having a lot of um, lower GI issues because you're just sending more undigested stuff down to the low intestine where wow. your microbiome could do all kinds of things to it. Or there could, there could be osmotically active solutes and you could have osmotic diarrhea. We're back to this. Again. We're back to osmotic diarrhea. This is what I do. I, I, I land the plane where I took it off. That's my, it's, this is my arc. And then down. I'm impressed. Thank you. It's almost like you planned it. <laughs> well, now we have to deal with like the last thing, like the last thing that everybody kind of wants to, wants to know, which is, can these things actually make you thin if you want to be thin, which is a big if, oh, but I don't care. <laughs> you don't care. Okay. Somebody out there probably cares about whether or not using non-nutritive sweeteners actually saves you from excess calories and metabolic syndrome and all of that. So um, the research is like pretty clear that like if you if you swap out alternate, you know, locale sweeteners for normal sweeteners in, in, a, in an experimental setting, in a highly controlled diet, where you say, you know, like, like you're controlling everything a person eats and you can literally just take the sugar out of the diet and put in sucralose or whatever. In those circumstances, people usually tend to lose a fair bit of weight. Where the, where the results are much less impressive is in like the actual wild. Where like the car commercials, this is on a closed course. <laughs> exactly. Wow, good comparison, honey. That's nice. Yes. Yeah. On on open course. <laughs> on the open road. On the open road. <laughs> it they don't seem to help people lose much weight. And there is like tons and tons of debate about that. We're not gonna get into all of it, but like one obvious thing is that it's like you know, I, I drink diet soda. It's not that I drink diet soda instead of regular soda. I would drink diet soda or water. If I didn't drink mm -hmm. diet soda, I would, drink, I would not drink regular soda. I just can't. The, the insulin response would just drive me wild. Like I would just get cranky. Um, no, I, I, well, I just can't imagine it because you accidentally take a sip of my Coca-Cola Classic mm -hmm. and you're just like, Ugh. Ugh, disgusting. Too sweet. Too sweet. Um. So, you know, people who consume, quote unquote, diet sweet foods might be doing so in addition, consciously, in addition to the other, you know, nutritive sweeteners that they consume, not instead of. Uh, but other possibilities, like maybe it just, it just acculturates you to eating super sweet things all the time. And so you crave everything to be super sweet. And then that ends up causing you to eat more of the, of the caloric sweeteners. 
Um, so it, it could be all that stuff. Um, but the big one that I want to end on, because I think it's so important, um, is the possibility that uh, non-caloric sweeteners actually do provoke an insulin response and can therefore contribute to diabetes, um, type two diabetes. They might cause there's, there's reason some people are concerned about that as a possibility that they would ironically contribute to one of the big problems that people seek to avoid by trying to avoid actual sugar. And no, no one knows why, um, you know, artificial sweeteners have been sort of shown in in, in studies, to, or it's it's been indicated that long term artificial sweetener use over time seems to result in is is associated with insulin resistance. And what insulin resistance is is that like when you eat way too much sugar, for example, um, you're constantly provoking your body to send out insulin, which is the hormone that allows your cells to take in blood glucose. And if you sort of do that all the time. Um, eventually the cells get sort of um, desensitized to the insulin or that's what's one of the grossly oversimplified mechanisms <laughs> that I could describe there. And as a result, your cells are not able to take in all that glucose. Your blood glucose goes really high, higher than it's supposed to be to the point where your blood can actually start to like damage the tissues that you're circulating it to. And, you know, diabetics end up with amputations and all kinds of horrible things. So, um how might it be the case that non-caloric sweeteners could provoke an insulin response and therefore contribute to insulin resistance? Well, one thing is what's called the cephalic phase insulin response. Cephalic just means head. Okay. Um, so basically what that means is that when you taste something sweet, mm -hmm. you're, a signal gets sent through your brain, through your head, somewhere else in your body to start releasing some insulin, mm. right? In anticipation of the sugar that's coming. So that could be part of what's going on here. But the thing is that the cephalic insulin response is very, very subtle, very small. So that's probably not like the main thing. Um, it could also, I mean, but there's all kinds of other things that could be where just the, the, the taste of sweetness or maybe the, the molecular presence of the sweetness in your digestive system, it just provokes horm other kinds of hormonal responses that could potentially contribute to insulin resistance over time. And that's not so great. And there's lots of ongoing research about that. And I think that that's something to watch and definitely something that gives me pause about the amount of artificial sweeteners that I consume, especially because like, with, you know, getting back to like erythritol, like the researcher who found that association, like wasn't even looking for it. She was looking for something completely different. Like a lot of, you know, a lot of these, these, these ingredients could conceivably have long-term chronic health effects that are as yet undiscovered, although they are among some of, you know, the, the most researched food additives in the world. And so, I don't know. So should you just eat sugar if you can? I guess I'm just going to go back to like my normal thing on that, which is just that I, I think Anything like this is kind of a stopgap solution. The real solution to the problem is appetite suppression because really just we just need to be taking in less stuff. And when you're taking in less stuff, you can just eat the normal stuff or the stuff you actually like, you know. Um, and I mentioned in, you know, a recent video about obesity uh, that – you know, I have a lot of faith in the new generation of appetite suppressants that are coming online that are sort of gut hormone based. Um, and I think that like, you know, they may end up basically solving the problem for us. The, the, the whole, all of the problems of food overconsumption, and those are numerous and not just limit, limited to individual health, right? Mm -hmm. All of the problems of excessive food consumption could potentially be addressed basically permanently by most people in the developed world going on a gut hormone based appetite suppressant. And I was criticized in the comments to that podcast where people were just like, Hey, you talked about these like drugs as though they're on the horizon, but in fact, there's like one on the market right now. Why didn't you tell people about it? And I guess I need to come out and like say it. And now, which is that like, yes, I didn't talk about Ozempic. Um, oh. Yes. And why didn't I talk about Ozempic? 
because it's thorny and involves all kinds of class discussions because rich people are taking it and it's meant for diabetics. That's the big one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's a diet, it's an anti like type two diabetes medicine. And because people are finding it to be so incredibly effective uh, at weight control, Wealthy people. Are Wealthy hiding. people. Yeah, it's incredibly expensive. It's like a thousand dollars a month or something like that, right? Um, and so there's like a run on it, and actual diabetics can't get it, which is why I studiously avoided saying the name of it out loud in that video because uh, I didn't want to contribute to the run on Ozempic. Um, but like, I, I, as I understand it, industry is responding, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure you know they they love selling things. <laughs> so if people want it, I think they're going to find a way to make more um, and get it out to us. And I'm not, that's not an endorsement of that particular drug. I have no idea. I'm just saying that I have a lot of confidence in this class of drugs to really help all of these problems for us in the future. Um, stay tuned. Watch that space, as the tech bros would say. Hmm. Do you feel like you're married to a tech bro today? No. Oh, good. Okay. No, because you just, I feel like I married you a real cute nerd. Oh. <laughs> All right. This is the end of the show. So you want to get your slap in? No. I no, you're not going to do the slap? I, I can't do it. I can't okay. Do it. All right. But I can't. There's no room for me to wind up over here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to break your glasses. The microphone's in the way. <laughs> Thanks for uh, hanging out with us for another app of the Adam Ragusea pod. Uh, you have anything you want us to talk about, go to askadamquestions at gmail.com. Send me an email there, ideally a video or audio file that we can play on the program, askadamquestions at gmail. Uh, let's see, what's coming up? Oh, um, I'm doing the Steak Diane recipe next. Ooh, that was really good. Which I tested on her the other day. That was good. It yeah. was really good. I don't like mushrooms, and it was good. Get excited. It's going to be cool again. I have a whole bunch of recipes I'm dedicated to making cool again, and that's one of them. Um, should I really be worrying about promoting red beef, red meat rather, beef? No, I shouldn't. I, I, I cook a lot less of that on the channel than I used to because I, and I think we eat too much of that. But you know, the, the gut hormone uh, appetite suppressants will help with that kind of, that aspect of overconsumption as well. So... I, okay, I just need to end it? Yes. Okay. Land the plane. <laughs> We're like getting turbulent over the runway. <laughs> Make good choices. Bye-bye. <laughs>